Good afternoon, and welcome to all of you. My name is Andres Martinez. I am the Editorial Director and Vice President at the New America Foundation. I also uh, coordinate our Fellows Program in New America, which is how we first connected with Peter Beiner. Uh, my role here today is to welcome you and, and get out of the way as quickly as possible, because I think we're all leaving this conversation. Uh, Peter Beiner, uh, as all of you know, and the reason you are here, has published The Crisis of Zionism. Uh, Peter is a senior fellow at New America. He's the chief political writer for the Daily Beast as well. He's the editor-in-chief of uh, Zion Square, which is a collaboration between the Daily Beast and New America. He also teaches journalism at the City University of New York. And I should say that New America uh, supports a fellows program whose purpose is to write timely books about public policy issues. Many of them are provocative, sometimes some of them are controversial, but occasionally we take a breather and we also support works like Peter's that don't make any waves and uh, don't upset anybody, so it's kind of a refreshing change of pace. Uh, I also wanted to thank E.J. Dion, uh, whom all of you, I think, are aware, is a uh, longtime story columnist for the syndicate columnist for the Washington Post. And thank you, E.J. So I will just hand this off to you. Really appreciate all of you being here. We are so proud of New America, Peter's work, in all seriousness, uh, both as a, he first joined us when he was working on his previous book, he was a great mentor to other fellows at New America, a great friend and collaborator, and we're very thrilled uh, to have seen, to, been, to play a small part in this project and going forward in uh, being a partner in Zion Square. So thank you, Peter, and congratulations. And Peter even brought his two adorable children here, so you've got to be on his side after you meet those kids. I feel in this theatrical setting, we should just sit here and recite Waiting for Godot. <laughs> it seems perfect for that. Um, I am very happy to be here because I'm a longtime fan of uh, Peter Beinert. I admire his writing, I admire his thinking, and I admire his courage. And I feel that way about him when I agree with him, which is most of the time, but I even feel that way about him when I disagree with him, which is some of the time. Uh, he, I think with this book, as in so many things he's written, he doesn't just uh, take a stand, he's actually willing to take inconvenient uh, stands. Uh, and I think this book reflects um, the view of a lot of people who genuinely love the state of Israel and are worried about the future of democracy in Israel. Whatever uh, people will agree or disagree with Peter's book, and yet I don't think anyone can doubt that the debate he wants to open up here is actually essential to the future of a democratic Israel. And I think, as for those of you who have not read the book yet, that love and affection just runs right through uh, the whole book. Um, I've been at uh, uh, sessions like this where they set it up with a moderator who's supposed to ask a lot of questions to make it look more like a TV show and less planned than a uh, very formal lecture. And yet one of the things that gets lost in those is that a writer never really has to have a chance to explain why he wrote the book and what he is really trying to say. And so before we go into any specific questions, I'd like to invite Peter to tell us why did you have to write the crisis of Zionism? I, I wrote it um, because it became, I began to think that by the time my two kids are over there, are, um, are adults, we will have either achieved a two-state solution which preserved Israel as a Jewish democratic state because it allows Israel to give back the territory on which uh, millions of Palestinian non-citizens live, or we will fail. And uh, the dream of a democratic Jewish state, which was so much a part of my experience of what it meant to be Jewish my entire life, um, will be gone. And then it seems to me, you know, a lot of people in the American Jewish community, I find, spend a lot of time worrying about the conversations they're going to have with older relatives of theirs, um, people who might not be uh, open to hearing any criticism of Israeli policy. But I began to kind of be haunted a little bit by the conversations that I might have 
with my own children about what I and people in my generation had done during this moment, uh, when it seemed to me the evidence was very strong that um, uh, uh, a continued process of settlement growth um, was going to eventually foreclose the possibility of a Palestinian state, See, which is not to say that the Palestinians themselves don't bear some of the responsibility as well. They do bear some of the responsibility. Uh, I think quite a significant amount of it. But there's an interactive dynamic that takes place whereby the more and more Israel eats away at the West Bank, the harder and harder it is to expect Palestinians to make the kind of compromises that they will ultimately have to make for a two-state solution to be possible and for a Jewish democratic Israel to survive. And um, so I felt that of all the debates and issues in American politics and foreign policy that were going on, none was as precious to me as this. Um, none was as um, emotional as this. Uh, and there was none that I felt uh, I would be haunted by as much if I didn't try to write something about it. Uh, even though I was extremely nervous and inhibited about it uh, for many, many years and didn't write about the topic for many, many years and avoided it. Uh, even though in some ways in my intellectual and uh, life it was kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, so I just decided gradually over time that I, that I would so that whatever happens, I can at least say that um, I took my best shot at what I think is the problem and at trying to shift the American Jewish conversation a little bit uh, in the hopes that I won't have to have that conversation with my kids one day. Thank you. Um, let me ask you about the whole idea of a two-state solution because there are many people both on both sides of the conflict and who are not part of the conflict who are very worried, uh, or in many cases worried, that the whole prospect of a two-state solution is slipping away, and that, in fact, uh, we may not have as much time, for those who support a two-state solution, yeah. we may have not have as much time uh, as we think. Um, I'd like you to analyze, if you would, what's happened on the Israeli side, and also what's happened on the Palestinian side, because I think there are so many, I mean, the word paradox was invented for this situation. Yeah. And that on the one hand, uh, there may well be majority support on both sides for uh, a two-state solution, and yet it's a majority that cannot ever seem to express its will on either side of the divide. First of all, is that an accurate portrayal, which it might not be? And second, uh, you know, could you talk about that? Because I think the problems exist on both sides of this divide. Yeah. I think, you know, you can, there's a lot of polling on, on this kind of stuff, and I've, I've looked at a fair amount of it. I, if I, I, I think it's probably true that there is majority support for a two-state solution on both sides. The problem is that what Israeli Jews and Palestinians mean by a two-state solution is really quite different. Um, and that is often not interrogated, necessarily. I think Palestinians believe that accepting a Palestinian state in all of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which means the Green Line, which means uh, all of these truths, is an enormous concession. Their perspective in my, it generally tends to be, look, this is 22% of British mandatory Palestine. This is an enormous concession we are making to you to take a Palestinian state in all of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and that should be the fundamental deal. And then beyond that, they tend to say, the right of return is absolutely central to our national identity. They don't necessarily say that they believe that all the refugees are going to return, or even that most of the refugees are going to return. But in my experience, talking to Palestinians, the right, the star of acknowledgement and the right of those people to decide is very, very core to their sense of what it means to be a Palestinian. Um, so that's one vision of the two-state solution. The Israeli vision of the two-state solution tends to be, sure, we have Palestinian state. Um, but um, we're not really sure that we want it to have East Jerusalem, uh, or which is sacred to Jews, or at least certainly not to have uh, that much of East Jerusalem. Barak, for instance, in his famous offer at Camp David, was willing to give the Palestinians a capital in East Jerusalem, which was enormously significant. I would even say very courageous from an Israeli perspective. But only some of the Palestinian neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, not all. So even there, there was a difference. And then the Israeli Jews would be. You can have a Palestinian state, but there are certain large 
consensus settlement blocks that are going to stay because uh, they're suburbs of major Israeli cities at this point. Malay Adunim, Ariel, the Gush block, um, and, um, and then the Jordan Valley, we're going to have to keep some troops in the Jordan Valley because otherwise it's just too dangerous because you've got a border with Jordan and goodness knows what can come across the border. Um, these are really quite large divisions and one of the, I think, the things that I find frustrating about the American Jewish conversation is its lack of understanding of where the Palestinians are coming from. Which is not to say the Palestinians are right, but you constantly, just to use a small example, you constantly find that in the American Jewish community people say Israel needs to give the settlement blocks. The Palestinians do not even accept the concept of a settlement block, partly because what is a settlement block? It's basically, you've got a whole bunch of small settlements, you draw a circle around it, and you say, we're going to keep this. Well, the Palestinians say, but wait a second, there are Palestinian villages in this little area. What are you going to do with those people? Are they going to become Israeli citizens? Are you going to make them leave their homes? Um, for me, one of the most frightening examples of all this is the settlement of Ariel. And I, I've had this conversation so many times with Jewish friends and family. I say, well, what are we going to do with Ariel? They say, what do you mean we're doing Ariel? Ariel is there. 20,000 people live in Ariel. That's Israel. What are you talking about? Um, uh, it's, you know, it's one of the consensus blocks right near the Green Line. But it's not near the Green Line. It stretches 13 miles into the West Bank. It essentially cuts right through the half, the northern half of the West Bank, essentially kind of severing the northern cities of the West Bank from to its south. Now, maybe you could get creative and build a, a bridge or a tunnel or something, but you can understand why the Palestinians are not so thrilled at having to accept Ariel. And so I then turn around to my friends and say, why do the Palestinians have to accept Ariel? I mean, what is so, what, what, what did they do to deserve this? I mean, why, what, is so, what is so necessary to Israeli security that it has to have Ariel? I mean, it's actually a finger, right? In, just from a security perspective, a finger straight into the West Bank makes no sense anyway. And ultimately, what they're saying is the Palestinians have to accept Ariel because we can't dismantle Ariel. Of course, we can't dismantle Ariel. There are 20,000 people there. And then I, that's what terrifies me. So, really, you're not saying that there's any reason that the Palestinians should have to accept it. You're just saying that you really can't do it. And, and yet, you're still basically fine with the Israeli government subsidizing more and more people to move there. Um, and that's where it gets scary for me. Um, uh, I think there is a profound gulf. Um, the question is, uh, how do you do the things that can get you close enough to being able to, to bridge it, rather than essentially going in the other direction? What, could you talk about why Camp David failed? Because that is the closest we have ever gotten. And there seemed to be, at the time, a fair number of creative efforts uh, to get around some, if not all, of these problems you mentioned. Uh, the Jerusalem, the effort on the Jerusalem problem. Uh, there were land swaps designed to make up for annexing some of the settlements that are genuinely contiguous. Yes, yes, yes. Um, why did that blow up? Well, you know, it's a little bit like asking what the causes of World War One are. You know, I mean, it's essentially to say it seems to have been this. First of all, just historiographically, a lot was not written down. Even Barack's famous offer that he made at the end was, an, was oral. And then what the Israelis did very often was they had, they went to the Americans. They essentially had the Americans convey the offers for them. So even amongst, the, even, if you look at the Israeli delegations writing about this, even on the question, this very important question, did Arafat ever counter offer, right? Um, uh, which has been one, uh, a lot of people say, even if Barack's offer was not perfect, Arafat never counter -offered. But there are Israeli negotiators who say he did counter -offered. Eli Sher, who was Barack's top aide, said he did count it on. Um, the Israeli negotiators are divided in terms of what happened. The American negotiators are divided, very famously, between Rob Malley on one hand and Dennis Ross on the other, with Martin Indyk and, 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 um, and Aaron Miller kind of somewhere in between. <laughs> and, and, and actually, there's very little Palestinian writing on the subject at all. Um, so it's, it's really just hard, darn hard to tell. I think that what you can say is this. Barack believed that he needed to keep 80% of the settlers, to incorporate 80% of the settlers in Israel. That was a, a, a kind of a, a, a defining political understanding he had of what was possible in Israel. Remember, he was in office not so long after Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. Um, he was concerned about what was politically possible. So I think he believed in, in his offer that he wanted to annex, he wanted to annex 9% of the West Bank um, and then give a land swap of 1%. Uh, and I think he and he and, and I think he believed that was going that would have made that would have allowed enough settlers to stay in Israel that it would have been possible. The Palestinians. Some people believe the Palestinians never made a real counteroffer. 
if they did, the Palestinians were always essentially in the neighborhood of more like 2 or 3 percent. And that hasn't really changed. If you look at the Omer Abbas negotiations, Omer offered 6.3 percent with a 5.8 percent land swap, and Abbas offered 1.9 percent. So this is one way of thinking. It's not the only issue by any means. There, I'm going to talk about the others, which are equally important. But in just terms of territory, you have an issue in this basically. Israel wants to keep uh, eight, roughly 8, maybe, maybe as low as 6 percent, because um, they feel like if that's the only way you can do it politically if you keep some of these larger settlements. The Palestinians feel once you get to that higher number, you create real contiguity problems for them with places like Ariel and not only Ariel. The Israelis also feel they need a true presence in the Jordan Valley. Um, and the Palestinians will accept international troops, but they will not accept Israeli troops in the Jordan Valley. That's, those are the territorial issues. Then on the, the, what are called the kind of 1967 issues. Then the equally or even, even more profoundly difficult issues are the question, are the existential, are, are you can call the 1948 issues, which are essentially Jerusalem and refugees. We know that at Camp David and afterwards that um, the set question of the Temple Mount was hugely, hugely difficult. And the Arafat was extremely determined not to give in on the Temple Mount. The, um, on, on refugees, the Israelis again are divided, the Israeli negotiators. There's some who believe, as most American Jewish commentators tend to, and they may well be right that the Palestinians were never, ever going to compromise on refugees, period. Um, others believe, like uh, Yossi Balin, who was a kind of dovish aide, and Sher himself believe that if Arafat had gotten the Temple Mount, remember, Arafat himself was not a refugee, like a boss, um, that Arafat basically was willing to trade refugees. When I say trade, they would say, we have the right of return, but you control your immigration policy. So it's a little like a legal fiction. The Palestinians get to say we have the right, but you can regulate your immigration policy. And, um, and maybe you have 10 or 20 or 30 or 40,000 people coming over a few years, mostly elderly people. Barack liked to say, we can let in salmon because they, they when they're old, they come to die. Um, uh, there were, some Israeli negotiators think that if you, the Palestinians had gotten what they wanted off the Temple Mount, they would have traded refugees. We don't know. Um, we, the, the parties got closer at Taba, but by Taba, the second intifada was underway, the Israeli government had lost its support, Arafat still did not react um, bravely or well to the Clinton parameters, which he, he, he kind of said he accepted, but basically then gave a thousand excuses, which meant he didn't really accept it. So we just really don't know. Um, uh, uh, I think you could make an argument that they were perhaps actually closer in 2008 with Omer and Abbas than they actually were uh, at, at, at Camp David. So what are if people, I want to, there are so many aspects of this book I'd like to discuss, and I also want to bring in the audience. Um, but I think that uh, if you take a lot of people who broadly agree with you on the urgency of the two-state solution, because there is, it, despite lots of talk, neither a one-state solution, which raises all kinds of questions about the existence of Israel as a Jewish state, uh, or a permanent occupation, um, the, the only thing between those two is a two-state solution. And yet, when people look back on those talks, uh, we, are, we all know uh, the gold of my airline that Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And um, the question is, did that happen again? Because I have found in uh, you know, discussing this question yeah. with friends, both like-minded and people yeah. I've disagreed yeah. with, you always end up back on this ground, yes, but they will in the end not say the magic words about Israel and they just won't get there. How, it, it, in order to advocate a two-state solution, you really have to have hope that we can get there. Where does that hope come from? And is it, first of all, do you think this analysis of the Palestinian position is unfair uh, or does it have some justice to it? And then how do you get there? I think it absolutely has justice to it. Um, uh, and actually one of the most frustrating and I would say painful things for me is about some of the, a few of the reactions I've gotten initially to the book is that I feel like people have not uh, noticed that I feel like I'm actually quite consistently critical of the Palestinians um, uh, for a whole series of things, and especially Arafat. I think Arafat was such a dictatorial and corrupt leader that he didn't have the moral authority to ask Palestinians to make some of the compromises that they ultimately needed to make. And he was not an honest leader, and he didn't prepare them for some of these compromises. 
He was, unlike Abbas, a strong leader with revolutionary credentials, but that's part of the tragedy, is that I think he had some ways greater capacity, but ultimately he wasn't really willing to use it. Um, um, on the other hand, so the Palestinians have absolutely missed opportunities. Arafat, uh, especially Arafat, I would say the single biggest failure was Arafat's response to the Clinton parameter, even more than his, that was December 2000, even more than his response to, to the, the Barak's offer at Camp David. Barak's offer at Camp David, the 9%, and then Israel in the Jordan Valley for 12 years, and the Palestinians only with control of some of the neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. Even Shlomo Ben-Ami, who was Barak's, became Barak's foreign minister, said he would have rejected that even a Palestinian. But the Clinton parameters were much better, uh, a much better deal. And there, I think, that was really Arafat's greatest failure. But I think it's also important to, to acknowledge, when one talks about missing an opportunity to miss an opportunity, that the Israeli, that the fact that the set, that settlement growth, you know, went from, you know, from, from roughly 200,000 or so uh, in 1992 to, to you know, 500,000, 300,000 in the West Bank, another 200,000 in East Jerusalem, has also been a way of missing an opportunity because it strengthens the most radical forces among the Palestinians. The, in Hamas and, and other radicals say to, to Fayyad and Abbas, what are you talking about this two-state solution? You want to go negotiate with these Israelis about the size of the pizza? They're eating the pizza. Um, and one of the things that drives the Palestinians crazy is, for instance, this Jewish neighborhood of Har Homa, right? The, the idea, the Israelis say, okay, in all the Jewish neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, we keep the Arab neighborhoods you keep. But Har Homa only became a Jewish neighborhood in the 1990s when it was built there by Bibi in his first term. Now he's building another one called Givat Hamatos. So the Palestinians say, wait a second, now we have to accept this. Why? Because we were eating the pizza while we were trying to talk about it. Which I think is also the great political fear that Abbas has, of being in endless negotiations while Israel continues to take more and more of the West Bank. So I think there have been very profound missed opportunities on both sides. I also think there have been real accomplishments on both sides. The accomplishment on Isa by Barak and Omer was to recognize we were going to have to give back most of the West Bank. That was hugely important. And Omer especially, I give a lot of credit. Um, the accomplishment on the Palestinian side was the very decision back in 1993 to recognize Israel's existence. And then their basic support for the Arab Peace Initiative in 2002 and 2007. And that was a missed opportunity on Israel, but on Israel's part. When all the Arab countries, in fact, even Iran, actually supported the Arab Peace Initiative initially, um, saying basically, we're willing to trade acceptance of Israel for 67 borders. And they even on refugees, they were arguably vague enough in their language on refugees that it really gave Israel a chance to, to respond positively. The Israeli government didn't. Uh, and so I think there have been real missed opportunities on both sides. Let me, one other uh, saw that one yeah. often hears yeah. that I'd like to run yeah. by you, which is, that it would be easy enough to make peace between Tel Aviv and Ramallah, but not between Jerusalem uh, and, say, Gaza. Uh, could you uh, unpack that for those who don't like these, uh, these sayings about Middle East as much as I do? And, and, and is there any truth to yeah. it? Because yeah. I, the reason I ask is what, what pains me about the current situation is that the economic development yeah. on the West Bank is really quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And it has created the basis for a viable state uh, that it, far more than ever existed on the West Bank before. Again, I'm curious if you see it that way. Yeah, I think there is some debate about that. I've heard some Palestinians say, you know, this is a bit of a bubble created by foreign aid. And we still, there's been a lot of foreign aid that's been in, it's built hotels and stuff in Ramallah, but essentially there's still not a functioning economy there that's sustainable partly because of the problems with simply uh, travel and movement, both within the West Bank, from the West Bank, and also to get in. I mean, Palestinian, like, you know, the Palestinian diaspora, which could be such, actually, Bernard, we have this new blog, I should promote it, by the way. Um, uh, it's uh, called, on the daily beast called openzion.com. It's a really unusual project in the sense that we have hawkish Israeli writers like Benny Morris and member of Knesset Einat Wilk. We also have Palestinian writers like uh, Hussein Hibish and Yusef Munayr, which is very unusual for a Jewish themed publication. Avishai has a very good piece about this. He has this great piece about going to the West Bank with Chinese entrepreneurs and the way it looks to them. Um, and some of their, the way they see the occupation, which is they see it as bad for business, basically. Um, um, on the Jerusalem, and, and I think one of the frightening things is that, I think this is a great, almost Oz has this great line that this is, is a real estate dispute and it must be seen only as a real estate dispute, not in cosmic terms. And, and I think there is an increased tendency to see it in cosmic terms on both sides. The, the corruption 
and, and oppression and failure to deliver on the side of the secular nationalists, the PLO, just as in all over the Arab world, has made it easy for Hamas to, 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 to move into the, into the breach. Um, and Hamas, um, even though there is a debate about whether Hamas has sent more compromising signals, there's certainly no doubt that Hamas has, is, is first, has not crossed, certainly not crossed the kind of Rubicon that I think Abbas and Fayyad arguably have crossed in terms of genuinely being for a two state solution. On the Israeli side, you have very powerful demographic changes. Um, a huge increase in the, in the Haredi or ultra Orthodox population. And what's frightening about that is that the Haredim were historically indifferent to the settlement project. They weren't part of it, they didn't care, they didn't even like the state of Israel very much at all, let alone t making it bigger. What they wanted was money. That's all they wanted, they wanted money. They had these ever-growing populations, they weren't working the men, they needed to suck the money out of the government for their yeshivas and their kolels and their schools and everything else. They were agnostic. That's why some of them were even said, gave justifications under halakha, under Jewish religious law, that you could give back the West Bank if it saved Jewish life and if it preserved good relations with the Gentile world. The problem is that Israel, because the Haredim have such huge uh, housing crises in Jerusalem and Nebra, other places, the Israeli government built them settlements. Um, the two largest settlements now are Beitar Elite and Modi'in Elite, which are ultra-Orthodox settlements in the West Bank. Now, they are very close to the Green Line, but essentially, there are many more ultra-Orthodox Jews on the other side of the Green Line now, which is coincided with a move by the ultra-Orthodox to be much more hawkish on this question. One of the things that people worry is that even if someone like Libni tried to form a government, she would have a lot of trouble. She couldn't pay these guys off and get them to support her, her two-state agenda in the way that Yitzhak Rabin was able to do, because they've become much more popular. Um, you also have, uh, and so, um, and of course the national religious, uh, uh, what we call here in the United States modern Orthodox, have always been very, very hawkish. They are the kind of core of the settler movement itself. These are both growing. And then you have this big Russian influx, which has been great for Israel's economy, very productive, but very, very um, uh, right-leaning when it comes to politics. Uh, and with, a, with a higher levels of hostility towards Arabs and Muslims than native-born, secular Israeli Jews. And all of that has created the political coalition that makes up the Netanyahu government, and uh, that I think constrains him in his ability to move boldly towards a two-state solution, even if he really wanted to. Would this book, will this book, be as controversial in Israel as it might prove to be here? Um, you know, the Israeli debate uh, is different um, than the American Jewish debate. It's funny, on the one hand, um, uh, Israelis are less inhibited because they're Israelis. They don't have to prove their bona fides. They don't have to answer the question, which I tend to ask, answer more than anyone else. Any other one, which is, if, you're so, if you care so much, why don't you just go live there? Because they do live there. Um, um, uh, and so, uh, in a way, that creates uh, a greater sense of, of, of not being inhibited. On the other hand, um, the Israeli, and this is one of the things that frankly makes it much harder for American Jewish liberals, the Israeli left has become very marginal. Um, very marginal. I mean, to talk to Israelis on the left today is a little bit sometimes like talking to American liberals right after George W. Bush got reelected, which is to say they're not only alienated from their government, they are to some degree alienated from their whole society. Um, because they recognize that the society is more in tune with that government than with them. And, um, and that's one of the, um, now the reasons for that are... Um, Actually, Kerry did better in the election, you know, in, if you're talking about 2004. Yes, yes, than, yes. The, than the Israeli left did in the yes, last election. Yes, the Israeli election's done very poorly, <laughs> and I think it's a combination of reasons. Partly it's demographic change. Um, you know, the most dovish group of the, in the Israeli population, the population that tends to show the most favorable attitudes towards Arabs are also the oldest cohort of the population um, uh, and, uh, and who tend to be more secular, secular Ashkenazi Jews. Also, there is a very powerful political narrative in Israel that exists, also exists in the American Jewish community, which essentially says, we offered them everything, they responded with a second intifada, which was incredibly traumatic in Israel. I mean, it was traumatic for the Palestinians too, but the randomness of the violence against civilians was incredibly traumatic for Israeli, Israelis. And then we gave, we offered them Gaza, and they responded with rocket fire. It, it's very important. I think, I think, as a matter of description, political description, 
that that is a dominant, very strong narrative in Israel. I think that the reality is considerably more complicated. And just as in the United States, one can recognize that there was, let's say, a political reality that, that emerged at certain points, like after 9-11 or you know, during the Vietnam War, that devastated the left, that may not actually be the same as an actual recounting of the historical facts. I think it's important that we keep these two things separate. Just because most Israeli Jews believe it doesn't necessarily mean it's the whole truth. Just as the Palestinian narrative about what happened, which is radically different, doesn't mean they are the whole truth. But, but politically, the narrative is very important, and partly because Barack himself used it. When, when after the Second Intifada started, and Barack had to run for re-election, Barack went out and said, I gave Arafat the store, and he responded with the second intifada. So when Barack said it, people said, well, of course. One of the fascinating things that's happened recently, and I mentioned a little in my book, is that several of Barack's key aides have come out and said, you know what, we said that during the election, but in fact, that wasn't really the full story. That it was actually, and that we really regret having said this because it helped to bury the left. But in fact, Barack was very much part of driving that narrative in his, in his hopes of beating Sharon, which he failed to do. Let me just ask you on that, and then I want to go to a couple other questions and open it up to the audience. Um, as somebody who has always thought of himself and still does as pro-Israel, but has also favored a two-state solution and, and has worried about the impact of the spread of the settlements, I've, I must say I have been chastened by, I was chastened by the Second Intifada. And when you listen to that narrative that you just offered, um, why is that wrong? In other words, what is wrong with the argument that says, put aside whether yeah. they offered them the whole store. Yeah, yeah. Let's say the, it was half a store. Yeah. Um, but let's say that there were talks going yeah. on. There yeah. was yeah. something that sure looked like yeah. a serious offer yeah. on the table. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that if there were, there were mistakes on the Israeli side, the decision to go for the second intifada yeah. really blew up so many opportunities and I think decisively set back the cause of doves and the left. Yes, yes. Um, I agree with you and I call Arafat's role in the Second Intifada a, a crime. Um, um, but I think it's also important The Mitchell, George Mitchell was actually sent at the time to do a report looking into the causes of the Intifada. Uh, and he found that the Intifada had um, several causes and I go into them in, in, in detail. Not to excuse Arafat, I want to know but to explain uh, that there were a number of factors in play that happened here. Um, the Israelis and the Palestinians were negotiating. Um, uh, on, the, uh, uh, um, uh, on the Palestinian street, there was uh, in growing, growing um, uh, frustration and anger because of settlement growth and because of the economic closures that were preventing Palestinians from, from going to their jobs in the West Bank. Um, and in fact, if you look at polling amongst Palestinians, you find that the percentage of Palestinians who think that they're going to get a state out of the Oslo process really starts to plummet, especially after Netanyahu takes power in 1996. So that by 2000, a month, Palestinians are much more pessimistic about where this process is going than they are in, say, 1995. So this is part of, I think, um, the, the, the dry tinder that exists, not to justify any of the violence, but just to understand politically what was happening on the Palestinian side, which was that the Israelis felt that they were moving in the right direction. The Palestinians in moving, getting towards the state. The Palestinians thought, what do you mean, getting towards the state? We're seeing new settlements crop up on every hilltop. We're moving away from the state, and our economy is worse because now we're having trouble getting the West Bank. The Israelis said, of course, we're not letting you into the West Bank because you're blowing yourselves up because they're suicide bombs. I'm just saying, this was the dual narrative that existed. <coughs> then, in a very sensitive time, Sharon went to the Temple Mount. Now, Sharon is a member hated figure among the Palestinians for his role in Sabra and Shatila. Um, so it's probably not a wise, he had the right to go to the Temple Mount, which is, again, the epicenter of this conflict, but uh, it may not have been the wisest thing. Palestinians started throwing stones. Mitchell focused, amongst other things, on the Israeli police overreaction. There were a million bullets fired by the Israelis in the first few weeks of what started with stone throwing and quickly escalated to Molotov cocktails and then to suicide bombings. So there was a, a cycle of overreaction that took place, which went, and I think one of the Israeli mistakes that, that, that Mitchell points out was a very, very strong overreaction to the initial bout of stone throwing that took place. And, and then I think then what happened was that Palestinian forces moved in, younger forces moved in 
to lead the Second Intifada, partly because they were emboldened by Hezbollah, what Hezbollah did, partly, frankly, because they saw it as a way of kicking out Arafat. They hated Arafat because he was a dictator, and also because he hadn't delivered. And people like Marwan Barghouti saw this opportunity to basically have a, re to have a violent struggle that would eclipse Arafat. And I think Arafat's most profound failure was his failure to stand, I don't think Arafat led and directed the Second Intifada. I think it was led and directed by younger Tanzim uh, in Fatah, but he didn't stand against them. He didn't say, absolutely not. He, he, led, he, read, he rode the tiger, <laughs> partly because I think he maybe he thought he wasn't strong enough, maybe because idiotically he thought he would get a better deal from Israel. If, uh, if, if, there, if there was also a violent, uh, you know, an armed struggle, whatever. But I think that there was an interplay of forces here that took place, um, uh, uh, and, um, and which had these very, 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 very profound consequences in, in terms of shifting Israeli public opinion, and also losing us many, many years in which we could have had serious negotiations. I want to ask you one personal question about your, uh, that you talk about in the book and talk about uh, very moving in person about your um, interactions with Palestinians on the West Bank and how this also altered your own view. And then I want to ask you afterward about the one view in this book that probably, if, if one assumes this is a liberal audience, about 90% of them will disagree with you. But I think, I think you know what I'm talking about. But what, please talk about your uh, experiences. Um, you know, one of the things that's hard, look, Israel in the West, in the West Bank, Palestinians are not citizens. Um, they have very little control over the state that really governs their lives. Um, they go before military courts, which are often conducted in Hebrew, they don't understand, which have prosecution rates of kind of 99%, according to some studies. They, um, they have to, they're at their travel, if they want to get to Jerusalem or to the Jordan Valley or inside, on the other side of Israel's separation barrier is really dramatically limited. This really has brutal consequences for people's lives. And it's hard for those of us who love Israel to face that because we believe that Israel means well, and we feel like we, in some sense, know those kids who are sent to serve in the West Bank. And we know that they're good kids. Um, uh, and yet, the more you interact with Palestinians, the more you're forced to confront that even these good people who we feel connected to, we love, we admire uh, so much, that there's a system in place that becomes brutal in practice. Um, and um, it's very hard to come to terms when you know people personally who've been brutalized by it. I mean, there was a guy who came to see me uh, a few months ago named Fadi Quran. He's a, I mean, literally, like, you could not dream up the more ideal Palestinian that is an American Jew or even Israeli you would want. This guy, he reads Martin Buber and Hannah Arendt. He, uh, he, uh, he, he, um, he's inspired by, he's a, he's a Gandhian, he's, been, he, he's, he's obsessed by the, by the civil rights movement and by the American Jewish role in the civil rights movement. He came to talk to me because he said, we want to do freedom rides in the West Bank, in which we get on buses and try to go to East Jerusalem, because we can't go to East Jerusalem, most of us. Um, and if we did this, in the spirit of the freedom rides, knowing that American Jews were so involved, do you think any American Jews would support us? And I have to say, just what? hearing him ask that question was so poignant to me, because the truth answer is that American Jews will never know. That's the real answer. We really will not know. They did do these freedom rides. They got the hell beat out. Nobody had any attention. Um, then get a confrontation with some police, this guy in Peveril. I want to say this, I know this guy is a good person. I just happen to know he is, because I know him. Um, uh, he was accused of assaulting some, an Israeli soldier, but there's a video, he did not assault an Israeli soldier. He was arguing with an Israeli soldier, he was angry, but he, got, he was beaten very badly. Um, and then put into det in detention for several days. Um, now has a secret file against him, can't leave the West Bank, um, doesn't know what's in the secret file because he can't see the evidence against him. And I talked to him recently about, about, it, about this question. And um, for me, the struggle is, how do I, how do I deal with this? You know, um, uh, how do I deal with it emotionally? Um, because I think one of the greatest challenges and difficulties, frankly, for Israelis on the Israeli left who go to the West Bank, most Israelis don't, except maybe in their military service. The people who go a lot find it hard not to feel alienated from their own society. Um, and I think that happens to American Jews too who go spend a lot of time. Most American Jews who go to Israel 
never go and experience Palestinian life under occupation. They never do. The birthright trips don't take you. The big guys who go to the, sing go to the King David Hotel six times a year to the mockers who meet with their Israeli mocker counterparts, they never do it. Um, and it's very, very powerful and very challenging and difficult. And um, I find that um, it doesn't mean the politics are not complicated. It doesn't mean the solution is simple. I'm not trying to say that. It is complicated. But, it, but politics can be complicated. And there can also be a moral reality underneath. And just while we shouldn't use the moral reality to obfuscate the political complication, we shouldn't use the fact that it's complicated politically to forget the fact that there's a moral reality. And the moral reality is one that I think American Jews have a lot of difficulty dealing with. I have difficulty dealing with it. Now, on your uh, proposal that may draw widespread dissent, uh, you call for government aid to uh, American religious schools. It occurred to me that there will be some readers of your book who will tear out all the other pages, but Xerox those particular uh, pages in your uh, book. Can you talk about why you have come to that uh, position? Besides our own our tuition bills. Um, uh, ah, so it's a uh, uh, self -interest, uh, it's an self interest. No, I have, uh, it's funny, this is the part of the book that's gotten no attention, but I hope we'll get some attention because I wanted to try to spark another conversation. Um, he wants okay. to make sure that no one agrees with yeah. the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> American Jew, the American Jewish community tends to be very, very, very worried about assimilation. Um, and about the fact that young American Jews don't feel very connected to Israel uh, and often don't feel very connected to being Jewish. Um, and the, the intermarriage rate is 50%. Um, um, I think that the, the fundamental failure of the American Jewish community is not to understand that it doesn't make sense to ask American Jews to care very deeply about something they know very little about. I don't care, no, I don't care very deeply about Australian rules football which probably has a lot to do with the fact that I don't know anything about Australian youth football. American Jews ask their kids to care deeply about something they have made no effort, they've made very little effort to educate them about. Now, what do they expect? Um, the other, uh, it's not easy to learn about Judaism. Um, the, the, but there's a very strong kind of correlation between Jewish commitment and Jewish education. And the Jewish communities around the world that are having much more success in the United States, Canada, Australia, England, France, are ones that have a very strong Jewish school system. By strong, I mean academically excellent and economically affordable, which is really not the case in the United States, where basically you basically pay till you pay astronomical amounts of money to schools that can't really compete academically often with the best public schools or the best private schools. Jewish schools will never be, I'm not, I'm not saying that all American Jews should take advantage of Jewish schools, it's very honorable to be involved, to go to public schools, but I think if you take the question of Jewish continuity and Jewish commitment seriously, which I do, you have to take seriously the question of Jewish education. And I think the, the most effective way, perhaps the only really effective way of doing that is in full-time Jewish schools. And they are not economically feasible unless you have some government support, which is the reason that they're successful in places like Australia and Canada and other parts. American Jews tend to be, Orthodox Jews, by the way, are thrilled about this idea. Because they're frankly just there's such such desperate economic straits trying to pay for these schools. Because Orthodox Jews do send their kids to Jewish schools. Other American Jews are afraid because they feel like it violates the separation of church and state. Perhaps it's my own family's experience in South Africa, where the government always supported with Jewish schools, as they do in Australia and parts of Canada. The Jews are not suffering a denial of religious liberty in these places. I think it's an exaggerated fear. I think if you have to look at the balance of risk. American Jews need to worry a little bit less about whether the government will give them the right to practice Judaism and a little more about the fact that, in fact, they're not taking advantage of it. Um, and uh, so uh, it's a controversial proposal, but I put it out there because I think that's another urgent kind of crisis that the American Jewish community is not really responding to. If this is a crisis, why is this particular crisis one that the American government should worry about? Um, uh, because um, I think it's, uh, I think we have the right to agitate for our own self-interest. Um, and um, it may be that this, this, this argument is from a variety of groups arguing from their own particular self-interest. The, the maybe some Catholics want it because they want Catholic schools, evangelicals or African Americans have their own interests. But I, this is an argument from Jewish self-interest. So um, I, I think, and I think the Jewish community has the right to say, um, we believe that this is, just as we say about Israel in some ways, um, this is something that we profoundly believe is in our self-interest and we have the right as citizens to, 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 to support something which is in our self-interest.
Um, let's, uh, <clears throat> we could just go on on that, and I could argue with you, but I won't do that right now. There are lots of points we've left. Um, I can barely see with the light, but there we go. We have a couple of mics floating around. Could we go, because the first hand I saw was, uh, this is going to be a lively audience. Could we go to this gentleman over here? Um, would we go to the nearest hand with the mic and then we'll organize Can I stop? <laughs> uh, who, uh, let's see, let's see, yeah, why don't, go ahead and then we'll pass it over. Thank you, sir. If you could, uh, I, I, if you could identify yourself, whoever is asked questions. Okay, hi, my name is Austin. Um, I want to ask you about two statements you made, and then I want to ask you a follow-up sure. questions related to that. Uh, in your introductory post to Zion Square, you say, um, my own deeply held belief is that, is that struggle should be guided by the principles of Israel's Declaration of Independence, which envisions a Jewish state that ensures, quote, complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants irrespective of religion, race, or sex, end quote. I believe that such a state can only be achieved through a new commitment to full citizenship for those Palestinians who lived in the Green Line. Um, and in a May 2010 interview with Jeffrey Goldberg, you said, I'm not asking Israel to be utopian. I'm not asking it to allow Palestinians who were forced out or fled in 1948 to return to their homes. I'm not even asking it to allow full equal citizenship to Arab Israelis since that would require Israel no longer being a Jewish state. I'm actually pretty willing to compromise my liberalism for Israel's security and for its status as a Jewish state. So my first question is, are we to assume that the first statement I read supersedes the one I just read because they seem fairly contradictory on their face? And secondly, um, I want to ask you about the Nekba, which is curiously absent from the discourse of uh, quote unquote liberal Zionists. And the echoes of the Nekba uh, within Palestinian identity, but also with, for Palestinians that are citizens of Israel. There are villages like uh, Kefir Baram, like uh, Ikrit, like uh, Ein Hod, I can go on and on and on, where the residents are currently, or, or expelled from the original villages. Uh, in the last two villages uh, that I named, they were expelled in November of 48. Uh, 48 and they live next door to them, but they are prevented from the state from returning to their original homes. So the right of return is also a right that is that citizens of the state are deprived of. So does that not um, expose the uh, supposed liberalism of some Zionists as a fraud? Uh, well, that's a, there's, a, there's a lot there, and, and, and um, it's, a, it's a great question. I should say, you know, the interview with Jeffrey Goldberg, as is in the nature of an interview, um, was uh, a kind of an off-the-cuff response. Um, and um, I think what's, I think the, my answer to the, the very beginning of the very first chapter of the book is essentially an, an effort to answer exactly that question, which is to say, I believe that there is a tension between liberalism and Zionism. Uh, there is a tension between the idea that this is a state that has a particular commitment to the Jewish people to safeguard and represent the Jewish people, and the statement in the Declaration of Independence that it will offer complete equality. You see that tension in the fact that Israel has a preferential immigration policy for Jews. Jews can get citizenship on day one, other people cannot. You see it in the fact that Israel has symbols in its flag, in its flag and national anthem, that are Jewish symbols that you naturally would not identify with uh, in the same way if you were not Jewish. I think it's important that Zionists accept that there is a tension. But I try to argue in the book a couple of things. First of all, that Israel is not the only country with that tension. Um, that there are a lot of European countries, actually, that have religious symbols in their flag and that have preferential immigration policies that we still consider to be liberal democracies. Secondly, that uh, there, is, you can under, there can be a tension between two principles and you can still believe that both principles are legitimate. You can say there's a tension between economic development and environmental protection, or security and civil liberties, and recognize this tension, but believe that there is some validity in both principles. And thirdly, and, and this is where I think um, I, uh, you know, in some ways the influence of my last two books really informed me a lot, and it's something that EJ has thought and written a lot about too. I'm a non-utopian or even anti-utopian liberal, which is to say, I measure my, uh, I measure my goal for progress vis-a-vis -vis 
what I think is a real world alternative, not the, the alternative that would exist in the abstract. And the reason I say this is because when I think about the real limitations on full citizenship that exist for, let's call them Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel, because there's some disagreement amongst uh, Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel about, about most, uh, they're used to, most used to call themselves Arab citizens of Israel, now more and more call themselves Palestinian citizens of Israel. I think you have to compare their status today to what their status would be like in a secular binational state, which is the alternative, which I think would be a bloody mess. I, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a viable alternative. Um, I, I think that the, um, you don't, ha I think binationalism is very difficult even in more placid countries like didn't work in, the, in Czechoslovakia, in Belgium, in Quebec, in Canada has a lot of trouble. In this part of the world where these two-party communities have been at war for a hundred years, I don't, I think you would recreate the civil war of the 1930s. I mean, what would it mean to have an Israeli, a, a, a military, some binational state that was half Israeli, half Jewish, and half Palestinian? I think it would be rival militias fighting one another. So I think that there are things you can do within the construct of Israel as a democratic Jewish state to dramatically move towards fuller citizenship for Palestinian Arab citizens. Some of them, uh, Yitzhak Rabin did, and I talk about it in my first, he equalized allowances for child, child allowances that the state pays people when they have children. He, he made a significant effort to build uh, health clinics in Israeli Arab neighborhoods. He, he, uh, he, he had civil, affirmative action for, for the Israeli civil service. Uh, he found a way, although he didn't go far enough, of allowing Israeli, Palestinian, Arab parties to participate in the Israeli government coalition. I think Israel needs a dramatically renewed commitment to that. And ultimately, you might even need to do, that. you could even get to a point where you, for instance, added a stanza to Hatikva, uh, which is a national anthem that talks about the Jewish soul. So it had a stanza that spoke in a way that, that Israel's non-Jewish citizens could identify with more, and therefore you wouldn't have a situation like you have today, where on the one hand, it's great that Israel has a Palestinian Arab citizen on its Supreme Court, but he doesn't salute the flag of the national anthem because he's not Jewish and he considers himself a Jewish symbol. So I think you could move significantly in that direction. Um, I say this because I would not say this if I did not believe, I would not be willing to tolerate those limitations if I did not believe that Jew, the Jewish history gives Jews the right to a state, a state that, uh, that is dedicated to Jewish protection, and if I did not believe that the alternative, in practical terms, would be both worse for Palestinians and for Jews. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman over here. So we have a question right here. He needs to scan the mic. Oh, OK. Whoever has the mic. OK. Uh, there are many questions that come up, but are you familiar with the book by Clayton Swisher? Yes. I, I said it in the, in the, yeah. Okay, because, you know, he presents a very different picture of the, what he calls the truth about Camp David than most of the other writers on the subject. That's, that's true. That, I would say my book is probably somewhere in between him, on the one hand, uh -huh. and the more conventional, let's say, Dennis Ross perspective, perspective on the other. But you're right. There is a lot of literature uh, on, on this question that is quite different than the conventional American narrative. It's just that most people haven't read it. <clears throat> okay, so that I won't discuss that anymore. On the question of when the Labour Party was in power yeah. during the Oslo Agreement, the number of Jewish settlement yeah. expansions yeah. was tremendous. Yeah. And in spite of uh, Perez and all talking peace, yeah. they kept yeah. expanding settlements, right? Finally, on the question of Jewish schools in this country, yeah. A lot of very rich Jews give a lot of money to Israel. Yeah. Why can't they be tasked to give money to Jewish schools? Um, they should, and I call for that. Um, but, uh, um, but the economics are such that it's simply, and I go through some of the that it's simply prohibitively expensive, and, and the only communities that have made it work are ones that have a provision for funding the secular aspects of religious schools. That's what they do in Australia, for instance. They will pay for the secular aspects of Catholic schools, Jewish schools, etc. Um, um, it's, um, it's, uh, um, that sounded like a political state. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's actually, I have to, during that actually, because Ezra, Ezra asked me a little while ago, because, you know, he often tends to focus on who wins battles. He said, what would happen if there was a battle between the, our Israeli president and our American president? And I thought, I can answer that question, actually, uh, as it turns out. We, um, um, no, I, I think you're right. I think that the, the 
The Barak, I think, basically decided that he was going to defer all his confrontations with the Israeli right to the very end. He was going to buy them off and buy them off and buy them off. He had very right-wing parties in his coalition. Until, and he was going to hold all his chits for the very end when he was going to try to. And I think um, you can argue the merits of that strategy, but, all, but you can under, it's important to understand that from the Palestinian perspective, and this is what I tried to say, and this is what is not very often present in the American Jewish perspective of we gave them everything, which is to say from the Palestinian perspective, and if you understand, want to understand why Abbas doesn't want to negotiate with Netanyahu without a settlement free, you have to understand that the Palestinian narrative of Oslo was that we, we sat around and negotiated and negotiated and negotiated and they kept eating the pizza. Um, and we don't want to go through that, especially with a guy who we're pretty sure is not interested in negotiating seriously anyways. You want to go through that for another 10 years, so you have a million settlers in East Jerusalem and West Bank, and that is a legitimate point of view. And I think American Jews and supporters of Israel have to recognize the way in which settlement growth poisons the possibility of meaningful, effective negotiations with the Palestinians by empowering those Palestinians who are most pessimistic and most hostile to a two-state solution. Who has the mic now? Please. I appreciate you having the courage to endure the controversy. I'm sure this is going to engender, especially bringing up the talk about the settlements as you just did. But uh, I want to ask more about the, have you considered the and I'm looking at it from the point of view of the United States, too, as after 10 years of a supposed war, uh, we're getting more and more with the hard right, and I think we really need to begin talking about the hard right, not just hawks, where they, you know, they call them the militarist corporativists, are gaining more and more political power, just like in Israel with the hard right in Israel, where we really are undercutting our own constitutional democracy. Now we have military detention mandated in the United States and the most recent NDA. So how does this re relate to that? So I guess, would you want to comment? I guess my question is, haven't we, aren't we losing our democracy by what we're doing to ourselves in order to maintain the oppression? Uh, you mentioned being from South Africa. You know that oppression so often has an even more harmful effect upon the oppressor and that they become, as you've already touched on, uh, harsher and harsher and more brutal. And so we are undercutting our own constitutional democracy in, in supposed defense against these people who are becoming more and more uh, uh, hostile to their own oppression. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the uh, South African Israel uh, analogies work because uh, because within in the Green Line, Palestinian Arabs do have the right to vote and citizenship. Um, uh, um, I, I think that there are a couple of important points you made. One of which is actually, and I, I do say this in the book, although I don't think my critics are going to notice it, maybe as much as I would like. What, for all that I criticize Israeli settlement policy, um, it is important, I, I do not necessarily believe that we in the United States, had we been in a state of kind of relatively permanent war, would have done any better. In fact, if you think about the way in which the United States has dealt with minority groups, who had any connection to our enemies, you know, German American during World War I, Japanese American during World War II, Muslim Americans after 9-11, it does inculcate a certain humility about recognizing the way we react during wartime in, uh, in, in, our, in, 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 uh, in looking at the way that Israel has reacted. And that's not to say that I don't think we have the right to criticize the Israeli action, but I do think it's important to remember that I don't necessarily, I think that, uh, I'm not necessarily sure that any, that any other democracy under those circumstances would have done it any better. Um, we have been much less threatened by Israel, and we've done horrible, horrible things during wartime. I think one of the fascinating dynamics that you, just to pick up on one other strand you mentioned, is actually the relationship between the U.S. military and Israel. I think that the most significant thing that's happening in the American political dynamic about Israel uh, is not actually what anything that's happening in the American Jewish community, it's what's happening in the U.S. military. Um, I think that if, if I were an Israeli right-wing leader, I would be less worried about J Street than I would be about the U.S. officer war. Um, I think the significant thing that's happening, happened in recent years, is we have a new generation of American officers. A lot of them have spent time in the Arab world. They know Arabic. They're sensitive to public opinion in the Middle East. A lot of them do believe that Israeli policy uh, are not good for American security. A lot of them are deeply, deeply hostile to the idea of getting dragged into a war in Iran. Um, and that worries me. I mean, because I believe in the U.S.-Israeli military relationship, I believe in the U.S.-Israeli security relationship, and I actually think that the Israeli leaders are not sufficiently 
cognizant of the degree to which they are breeding uh, animosity within the US military, which is ultimately, I think, a more politically, potentially politically important force in all of this than liberal Jews like myself. Why, why is it that you say it's the Israelis who are breeding this animosity? Does it come from Israeli policy? Or does it come from time in the Arab world spent by the officers? Or what? I think, what what's the arrow? I here? think it's because a lot of people in the US military and a lot of national security experts genuinely do believe that the Arab Israeli conflict is a good recruiter for jihadist groups. Um, not just uh, that, that it, it is an effective propaganda tool for them to use. In fact, the Baker Hamilton Commission report, although it didn't get very much attention, made the point that during the Israel's 2006 war in Lebanon, there was a spike in attacks against US troops in Iraq. Didn't get that much attention, but it was a very sensitive point that was made. And, it, and one of the fascinating things that if you look at the dynamics of the Obama administration, was that Gates turned out to be the most left-wing, or, or the guy who supported the most pressure on Netanyahu, anyone in that government. Um, uh, uh, and now Panetta is also in it. I mean, and that's because I think they're getting this pressure from what's coming up through the uniformed military. And I think it's a really significant, interesting development. I think that, and that I think particularly was brought to bear when Obama went out there with his speech about 67 lines plus swaps and basically got kind of publicly slam dunked by Netanyahu. After which, great Gates said this, something about how, about ingratitude or something like this. Petraeus had this very, you know, also made a very, very controversial statement about this. So I think that there's more going on um, under the surface. And I think it is because, um, uh, it's, it's maybe partly because the Palestinians haven't been shooting themselves in the foot as much recently. I mean, there has been less, Palestinians have always deeply undermined their cause by their resort to violence. And since, two, since Cass led, since 2009, there has been less violence, less terrorism, which is partly, partly the reason that they are doing a little better in this public relations struggle, which is taking place uh, amongst everybody, but also within the US military itself. I'm gonna, I'm sorry to do this. Um, but I'm gonna have to cut this off. Um, the subject is so rich and talking to Peter is always so interesting that I, 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 I'm, I'm feeling like we're just getting started <laughs> and I want this to go on and on. Um, but we also want you all to buy the book and have a chance for Peter to sign it and have refreshments and to continue the conversation amongst ourselves. So really, thank you, Peter. Congratulations, thank you.